Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Throughout the Bible, we find people who are in deep trouble. And in our reading today, our first reading, Ahaz is no exception. He is in deep, deep trouble. If you like, turn to that uh, section on page two in your program. <clears throat> you see, uh, the Assyrians, the most powerful people at that time, they were at the Tigris and Euphrates headwaters and they were about to come down and, and they were making rumblings about expanding and they were gonna come down the Fertile Crescent on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean and, and take over these small countries there. And, and they had done the same thing a century ago and, and the small countries had bound, had joined together to fight the Assyrians and they'd done okay. And so the king of Syria and the king of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, they wanted to join together with, uh, the ki with Judah and to fight the Assyrians. And so they came to Ahaz and they said, look, here's the deal. They're coming after us and we're going to have to join together to fight them. Will you join us? And Ahaz couldn't make up his mind. He just refused to make a decision. And, and meanwhile, they were getting more and more impatient. And so they said, well, you know what? If he won't make a decision, we're just going to go down there and take over Judah ourselves, put in a puppet dictator, and, and that, that's a, that'll be the end of that. And so Ahaz could not decide what to do. And so Isaiah came to him and said, look, you see that woman over there who's definitely pregnant? She, by the time her baby is old enough to tell right from wrong, the two kings that are bothering you will be disappeared. And Ahaz still couldn't make up his mind. And then it says something very, very interesting, and I invite you to look in your bulletin. It says at the beginning of this reading, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Well, it wasn't God that said, Ahaz, do this. It was Isaiah. And so God worked through Isaiah to speak to Ahaz. And that's the way God works. He works through people to make his will known. And that's where all of us come in. He works through us. But there's plenty of other people in the Bible who, who need a good dose of hope. It doesn't take, it's not hard to think about these. Just look at Joseph. You remember Joseph, the coat of many colors. What did his brothers do to him? They sold him into slavery. Sold him, got rid of him. And he goes down to Egypt. And what does God do for him down there? He makes him number two in the whole country right next to Pharaoh so that he can save that country from starvation. And then look at the burning bush. God appears to Moses, a peaceful, uh, he's a peaceful, he wants to, all he wants to do is, is take care of his sheep and his goats. And God says, no, I want you to go lead my people out of Egypt into the promised land. And, uh, and Moses said, no, I can't do that. I stutter. You can't lead a great nation if you don't like to give speeches. How could he lead a great people? And then there was Goliath and the menacing Philistine army coming around. Who's going to fight Goliath? And, and the person that ends up fighting Goliath is, is the shepherd that is way off, away from harm's way, taking care of the sheep. How do you figure that? And then there was Elijah. Elijah, right at the showdown at Mount Carmel, Elijah had just brought down fire from heaven to, to light this sacrifice that he had just doused three times with water. And then Elijah kills all of the prophets of Baal and fled for his life because Queen Jezebel was very upset about that. And, and as he 
sought a safe place to be, Elijah actually thought that he was the only prophet in the whole world. The only one left from God. And so, so it is throughout the whole Bible. People are faced with, it looks like, impossible situations. And life can be like that for us too. There are occasions in our lives when we have no idea how we're going to meet the challenges that lie ahead. For many people, this could be about inadequate food or shelter. Others are having to go through this Christmas in, with the absence of loved ones. For others, it could be a medical issue, either theirs or someone they love. And if we stop and think about it, many of the challenges that we have are not that different from what we find in the Bible. And that's one of the many reasons we study God's Word, to see how His people handled adversity and how God intervened in their lives. Look at the Virgin Mary. Here's a young girl, 12 or 13 years old, who had an amazing visit from the angel Gabriel who told her that through the power of the Holy Spirit she was going to become pregnant and bear the Son of God? How would that work out? In her culture, being pregnant and unmarried was a capital offense. She could be stoned. Because she was pregnant, who would marry her? And then there was Elizabeth. Elizabeth, long past the age of childbearing, being married to a man who was likewise way past being able to father a child. Here was her husband, the priest, been in the temple, came out, could not talk, and he wrote down something about this old woman going to have a baby. Are you kidding me? So what amazing plans God has in mind for these women. Of course, neither would know how things were going to work out. But God had a plan for them. And the most important thing is that God also has a plan for each one of us. He has a plan for your life. But when we're in the middle of crisis, sometimes it's kind of hard to see where God is in all of this. My doctor says that it's important for me to exercise. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever heard that before, right? Did your doctor ever tell you that? Get up, do something. Well, I've got lots of excuses, but the fact is that our muscles get stronger by meeting resistance and forces that oppose them. And life is like that for our souls as well. The muscles of our souls are courage and character. And they get strong only through struggle and pain. In fact, they get strong only with a few defeats. Since strength of soul means wisdom. And wisdom comes from suffering. We learn the most from our own mistakes. And so you can't be really happy unless you have a deep, strong soul. And you can't have a deep, strong soul unless you have suffered deep unhappiness. And therefore, you can't be deeply happy unless you have been deeply unhappy. The wisdom gained from suffering is not a drug for pain, but wisdom gets you out of bed in the morning, gets you up and moving. And the fact is that God does have a plan for each of us, but it will probably occasionally include some suffering. And certainly it's no fun to endure, but nevertheless, God can use it for good. He's that powerful. And we never, ever know how God is going to use us to give hope 
to somebody who is suffering. There's a story about a little boy who wanted to meet God. And he knew it would be a long trip, so he, he got out his suitcase and he, he put a, a package of Twinkies in there and a six-pack of root beer, and he shut it up and headed down the street. And he walked about three blocks, and he came to a park, and there was an elderly woman on a bench in the park, and she was just had this blank look on her face, and she was staring at the pigeons. And so the boy sat down beside her and opened up his suitcase, and he was about to have a drink of his root beer when he noticed that the lady looked hungry. And so he offered her a Twinkie. And she gratefully accepted and smiled at him. And her smile was so pretty that the boy wanted to see it again. And so he offered her root beer. And once again, she smiled. And the boy was thrilled. And so they sat there all afternoon, eating, drinking, and smiling. But they never said one word to each other. And finally it grew dark and the boy knew it was time to go home and he got up to leave. But after walking a few steps, he turned around and ran back and gave the woman a great big hug. And she gave him the biggest smile of all. So when the boy went home and opened the door to his house, the mother looked at him, his mother, and said, Why are you so happy? There's a joy on your face that I haven't seen. And he said, I had lunch with God. But before his mother could say anything, he said, you know what? She, she's got the biggest smile I've ever seen. <laughs> and the, and the old, old woman went home and her son asked, why are you so happy? And, and she said, I had Twinkies in the park with God. And you know, He's a lot younger than I expected. <laughs> we never know how or when God will use us to provide some hope for somebody else. Mary's visit to Elizabeth was a very unlikely occasion when this pregnant 12 or 13 year old girl went all by herself from Nazareth all the way to Jerusalem. I think that's about 60 miles by herself to visit an older relative who was likewise unexpectedly pregnant. They encouraged each other and they marveled at what God was doing in their lives. So when the Holy Spirit whispers in your heart to help somebody who needs some hope, you may be the only one that is able to help them. May we all have the grace to respond to God when he speaks to us so that we can provide hope just like that little boy did in his own way to someone who desperately needs us. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.